I used to listen to Radio Hallam, the local radio station, and I remember they had a rock show on Monday nights, presented by Colin Slade. And I remember him saying, it was after the Sex Pistols had done the swearing on television and that, and he said, well, you can rest assured that you won't be hearing any of that punk rock music on this station because it's not real music. And, uh, you know, I was really curious about it and wanted to find out about it. So I remember then flicking through the dial on the radio and uh, that was when I first came across John Peel then and he was playing an Elvis Costello record and then that's really what I found out about punk from. You couldn't, as I say, the local radio wouldn't play it so I had to listen to John Peel and that would kind of keep you abreast of what was happening. Were you sort of inspired by the music at all or the scene? Or? Well I was, yeah, because cause I always wanted to be in a group when I was at school just because, probably because I couldn't do sport or anything and I wanted to be in a gang or something. And sometimes I would pretend that I actually was in a group with whoever was stood around me at the time. <laughs> and, uh, but I always thought well, I wouldn't be able to do it because I, I got a guitar but I couldn't play it. But then because the punk thing said, well, it doesn't really matter if you can play too well, as long as you know a couple of chords, then you're all right. <clears throat> and so um, when that happened, um, it made me think that we could have a group, so we started rehearsing at my mother's in about 1978, I suppose it would have been. Mm. Would it have been? Making Saskia leave the house sometimes? Yes, I was sent out and, or, or sometimes roped into playing drums very badly. Yeah. Oh, you played the viola, viola, didn't you? And, uh, and the viola very badly as well. But, um, yeah, I, I, was, I remember once being roped into having to stand in as the drummer. Yeah. I always kind of wanted it to become a bit more and um, really what we probably would never have graduated from the living room if it hadn't been for there was a, an advert in the Star one weekend which was for this record that was put out called The Cave of Steel which I think came out in 1980 mm. and it said if you are a local band send your tapes in for this thing and even if you don't get on the record you'll be in this booklet that's coming with it which is listing all the local bands so we sent our tape and and stuff and we didn't get on the record but we got a little kind of two inch thing in the booklet so um, that was really exciting and, and there was an address on the thing so we went to the address that was on the record and it was um, this bloke Marcus Featherby who did Aardvark Records um, so then we just used to go and pester him, like because he, he'd, he'd make excuses like, oh, you'd take, I couldn't really hear the tape properly, so then we'd try and do another one, trying to put the cassette recorder in a different place where it might be a bit clearer. And then I borrowed my grandma's cassette recorder because I thought that was better quality. <laughs> and we'd always, we'd just keep going up, and he never was impressed, but eventually, I think because we were kind of um, getting on his nerves, he uh, put us on second from the bottom of the bill on this all-day festival, at the lead mill that was held on the 18th of August 1980. Oh no, you, you remember that. I'm like, you very like that. impressed. Oh. And um, we did that, and uh, we were popular mainly because we were very inept and quite. I mean, a lot of other groups have kind of taken themselves quite seriously, but we were just so poor. Like the the bass player, we got this feedback going, and he couldn't work. He knew that if you walked away from a speaker, eventually feedback would stop. So he started walking away from the, his bass amp, but then didn't look where he was going and fell off the stage. And just stuff like that. And so they just probably thought, what who were these stupid children <laughs> who cannot play <laughs> their instruments? But, but I guess they probably quite liked us because we were amusing. Um, yeah, I think you were liked by most people. Yeah. Well, but of course, well, we thought we were very, we, we thought we were much more artistic yeah. than that. But, but people came along because they knew that, it, you know, that something would be happening. It wouldn't be just people just kind of stood there singing. You know, there'd be quite a lot yeah, happening. We'd, yeah, and we'd try and do interesting stage sets and stuff like that. And, uh, to give people value for money, really. Mm. Value for their 50p. Mm. And then you could always see whether my glasses fell off and how long it would take me to find them before mm. we could do the next song. And so people quite liked us. And from doing that, like, people came up and talked to me afterwards and we got offered like concerts at, upstairs at the Hallamshire. And once, once we'd actually started, you know, once we were in the kind of loop kind of thing, 
then you'd play and then other people would ask you to play. And, and so we, we were doing it then. But without that initial thing of badgering Marcus Featherby, um, we wouldn't have got... Because we just didn't know how he went about getting concerts. It all seemed... Because, like I say, we were too young to go to pubs, so it seemed a bit impossible to play in a pub. So without that kind of first initial little chance, we probably wouldn't have... Uh, we'd have just kept getting drunk on Friday nights in my mother's living room, I suppose. Mm. And we would... I was... I mean, I was personally very excited because it allowed me to go into pubs underage. Because um, I think when we played our first concert, I was nearly 17. And then we got asked to play like the Hallamshire and places like that. And because you were the band, then there was no question of getting asked your age, you know. Mm. So you, we were straight in there, mm. getting the lager and black currant down mm. us. The main thing that happened that also was the thing that made me keep going with the group was um, we did a demo tape. We eventually scraped some money together by about 1981 or something. And um, that was a classic because it was this bloke called Ken Patton and he was about 54 and basically his studio was in his house and you, the mixing desk was in the kitchen and you played up in the bedroom but um, his wife didn't like noise, so he had one of those Simmons kits, you know, those electronic drum kits, which don't make noise. But then also, because you had to play in the bedroom, he didn't want any hanky-panky going on, so he'd set up a CCTV thing so he could watch you down in the kitchen and make sure you weren't messing the bedroom up and stuff. You know, it was really... <laughs> it was very, you know, make-do kind of thing. And I remember we finished doing that, and then John Peel was doing a road show in, in, at the Polytechnic, as it was called then. And I went down and I gave him a copy of this tape and then I got a phone call a couple of days later and they wanted us to go and do a session for the John Peel show, which, seen as listening to John Peel had been the thing that had kind of got me into music and taught me a lot about music. Um, I was very excited about that. And we went down and did it and we got in the star, which we were very pleased about. That was really exciting, wasn't it? Yes, they came round to our house mm. to take pictures of us and they wanted us to do one picture in school uniform and one in stage clothes, and we said no, because we were already knew where we were at. We weren't going to sell out. No. So we didn't do the school uniform picture. And, uh, and, and so that's what kind of... We did that, and I was then convinced at the age of um, 17, going on 18, I thought, well, that's it then. We're going to be famous. So... Um, it was coming to the end of school and I just decided that I would put off going to university and would stay in Sheffield and do the band. But unfortunately, the other members of the band ha had stricter parents and they all had to go to university. So I ended up just in Sheffield on my own. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering what to do. <laughs> and that's when I got involved with Simon Hinkler from Artrey and they were having a bit of a rest at that time and he kind of came round and helped me with writing songs and stuff and Tony Perrin, the manager of Artery, said, well, get some songs together and I'll, I'll put £500 in and you can do a record. If you can do it for that money, then you can do a record. So that's how we did our first album, £500. Is that how much it cost, £500? Mm -hmm. I think so, yeah. Down at Victoria Studios yeah, on the Wicker. Yeah. Yeah. Really? And Saskia was doing the singing. It was influenced a lot by Leonard Cohen. Yeah, we used to listen to him a lot then, didn't mm. we? Oh, Lenny. It, I, I guess when it first started out, becoming successful weren't so much a the big deal, it was more like everybody else was doing it, so you better do it. And it was, and like I say, it was just a scene. And Did to be idea. part of that scene, you kind of had to at least pretend to be doing something. And, and to be in a band. At it least was quite important to the arty, mm. wasn't it? As long and as you had a name. That was really important. You know, if you had a name for your group, you, you didn't really have to play, probably. As long as you had a stupid name, like mm. Defective Turtles or something like that. Mm. And made out that you were doing something, then you'd be allowed to be mm. be there in the pub, you know. Yeah, because there was only like two or three pubs you could go in. 
then as if you were stood in the pub, you were kind of part of it. But mm. there might be certain parts of the pub that would be more the upper reaches. Mm. And we'd probably be slightly down the other end of the bar. <laughs> but thinking, oh, yeah, we're in it, really. <laughs> The worst thing that happened to me was I got kebabbed. <laughs> when I was waiting outside the cathedral and I had a black plastic mac on and these kids came up and said, oh, somebody left rubbish out, because <laughs> it looked a bit like a bin bag. Mm. Um, and uh, they were just giving me some, and then my bus came, but I think I was a bit drunk and I didn't realise what the buses used to do, they arrived and they'd let you get on, but then they'd wait for 10 minutes before they went off. So me thinking I was clever, got on the first step of the bus and went, fuck off! <laughs> <laughs> and then got on back at bus and then and I was expecting the bus to go and then I suddenly realised, oh shit, it's going to stand here for ten minutes now. And they were all there coming up to the windows, giving it that one. And then I just saw what the, like, the ringleader get on the bus and I thought, oh no. And uh, he kind of walked right to the back of the bus where I was and then his arm came from behind him and he just went, <laughs> and, uh just shoved this kebab in my face. Did they have chilli sauce on it? Yeah, it was, it was horrible. It sting your eyes. Yeah, it was horrible. So then uh, the rest of the bus journey was me kind of at the back of this bus with lots of bits of shedded cabbage on me. <laughs> <laughs> Stinks smelling really nice. <laughs>